There's so many hot guys in Vancouver, I can't believe it. People live without a lot of boundaries in Berlin. They're like cocky boys. Yeah. They're like kind of mean, the Dutch gays. I didn't really like Colorado. We're like cutthroat gays. It is stressful to just exist. The painful part is the gas. A lot of these people that are successful are also bad people. When you look different, it all of a sudden bothers them. They're just like, hey, yeah, we're horrible. Reward people that are nice. Cut out my stomach. Daniel Ryan Spudling. Art. Uh, comedian, the person who lost 240 pounds. I said I lost a lot of weight. Recently. Person who was very vocal about all political stuff recently. And person who is an uh, incredible journey. Mm -hmm. You guys might know him or might... <laughs> He's getting comfy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, you guys might know him or might not yet. But you'll get to know him today. Daniel, yeah. thank you so much for coming. So, Daniel is... Uh, where are you from? Uh, I was raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 25, I moved to Europe. And I lived mainly in Europe my whole adult life. And then I moved here last year. I kind of wanted this podcast to be like all over the place. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be fun and tragic and uh, serious and, uh, you know, fun again. But I think what's uh, very, very, uh, very impressive for me is your whole story about how you lost your weight. And uh, I like the way you were open about it mm -hmm. and the way you were like strong about it. And I feel like a lot of people would admire it a lot. So I just wanted to jump into this couple okay. things. I wanted to ask you like, when it comes to bigger weight, mm -hmm. like was it like this for you when you were growing up or there was some specific time and how did you feel? So um, I started gaining weight when I was about seven years old. So when I was a little boy, I was like very active and, you know, I had a, you know, I was like, you know, like any other little kid. Uh, unfortunately, I suffered a lot of tragedy in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother died when I was six years old. And then another one of my brothers um, nearly died in a drug overdose when I was 11. And uh, there was a lot of different problems in my family. Um, my parents eventually got divorced. And so I ended up, you know, when you're dealing with trauma and depression and you're a kid, you, you don't move enough and you don't uh, play enough. And so I ended up kind of getting a little bit heavy. And then that ends up becoming sort of a complex when you're a kid. And so like a lot of kids that are sort of the, the fat kid ends up excelling really well at school or uh, has a very active imagination. And so I think that that is something that really contributed to my creativity and to my um, thirst for academics and intellect. Do you think that being gay also contributes to this? Definitely. Like you yeah, have to definitely. survive more and you have to yeah. protect yourself, play an actor character. Yes, absolutely. So when it combines, you're like double creative. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And also I was, I, I've always been a very empathetic person as well, because I know what it's like to suffer and for people that are suffering in silence or going through who have different blocks in their life and are in a lot of pain, I really feel for them. When it becomes a complex and you're a kid, then you end up, you know, getting bullied and, uh, and it's just, it becomes this thing that's like a very deep seated shame and a very deep seated pain in your life. And if you never end up uh, addressing that and resolving that and working through those sort of deeper spiritual things that you need to work through, it will eventually come back to you. And so um, in my 20s, like there were times where I lost weight. I, I lost a lot of weight when I was 18, but then I gained it all back. And then like, I... Did you change your lifestyle or how did it happen? Um, or it was... Yeah, there were different times in my life where I would go and like really f get myself together and focus and really try to like like conquer it. Um, but then I would gain it all back. So that happened when I was 18. And then I, that happened again when I was 25. Uh, was there moments when like someone was just bullying you at home at school, let's say, and then you would just come back home and you were like, how can I be better than those people? And there was like, I want to be funny. I want people to like me. So comedy was for you like, okay, that's a way for me people to like me the way I look. Um, I don't wasn't necessarily that think that I don't think it was necessarily coming from that. I think that I was always sort of uh, an intelligent 
kid and and observational and I think it was more I think my creativity more came from sort of a an escapism and an imagine like I have a high very active hyper imagination. Did you want to prove someone that you're good or no? Um no, I never really thought about it that way. I think I always excelled in school and in terms of uh academics because I just was it's, good at that. It's fun. The reason why I'm asking because that's what motivated me a lot when I was in high school when teacher oh, really? yeah when teacher would say you're not like good enough you're probably just gonna study you're never gonna learn English mm. and then I was like okay I'll just show you or like the, gr- oh. the girl that I liked she would like not pay attention to me so I would go extra mile to become like president of the school or like mm. be very very active to prove them where are you now <laughs> yeah so that's like how I dealt with this oh I, I don't really pay that much attention to what people think about me mm-hmm. because I know I've learned through my throughout my life that people are gonna dislike you regardless of what you yeah. say and what you do especially now where everyone just hates everyone all the time so, so it's best to just be true to yourself and live your life on your own terms <laughs> What motivated you to leave Canada and go to Europe? Well, to Germany? Yeah. What I went, a choice. I went to a lot <laughs> of different places. But uh, Canada is, well, now it's kind of different. Like, mm-hmm. I went to Vancouver a couple of weeks ago. There's so many hot guys in Vancouver. I can't believe it. Mm-hmm. And they're all these, like, fit, outdoorsy gays. I, I think, like, like every hot guy in, like, Canada has moved to Vancouver. When I was in, when I lived in Vancouver in my early 20s, like, it was either, like, everyone was this sort of, like, twinky bottom, super skinny little twink or these like really grizzled old bears Mm -hmm. like beards and but now it's like all the and and all the guys in their 20s and 30s and 40s who were like really well put together they were all just sort of at home hooking up like back in the Craigslist days. Okay. But now... <laughs> a lot of Gen Z don't know yeah, what it's here, but... Craigslist was like, that was before Grinder. Okay. But now I went to Davy Street and like, holy moly, like all these hot guys are in Vancouver now. All these like really successful, good looking guys in their 30s and 40s. And Hot take, do you think guys in Vancouver is hotter than the guys in New York City? Well... Or they're comparable? I think maybe Vancouver might be hotter. Okay. Because in in New York, like, the guys are a little... Well, there are, like, really ridiculously hot guys here, but not just, like, out in the in the bars. Like, yeah. you have to get the hot guys at the house parties. In New York, it's all about... Fundraisers. <laughs> fundraisers and, and uh, gala events. All the power gays are not as accessible, whereas in Vancouver, they're just there. And they're very, like... Um, Uh, they're outdoorsy gays connected to nature Mm -hmm. like new york gays are we're like cutthroat gays we're like uh we're the lawyers and the bankers and we're the like we're the business gays we don't fuck around we're really high powered gays yeah but the power gays in vancouver are they're sort of like these like earthy men that will go kayaking and you're gonna go camping with them and like Mm -hmm. like they do all the gym shit and like and they're like they have their shit together, but they also love clean air and hiking. Do you think there's a bit like Colorado gays? I didn't really like Colorado. Like I, I was there for one day though, so I might be. It's, but do you think that uh, where does it come from? Like just because they like to be outside? Because it's also a big city. Yeah, well, it's not that. Vancouver is not that big of a city. Mm-hmm. It's like, a, it's Chicago? sort of a small city. Okay. It's a small city, but it's, uh, yeah, definitely. It's like an outdoor gym, mm-hmm. Vancouver, yeah. Okay. So-, so for me, at that time in my life, when I had so much thirst for travel and experience, it was just the boringest place ever. Mm-hmm. And it still, for me, is pretty boring. I wouldn't want to live there. But um, but to visit. Canada. Yeah. Overall. Yeah, in general. I like, uh, as messed up as America is, I enjoy it. Uh, a lot of people are probably going to take your hot take for this. So. But actually, yeah, Canada has been given getting a lot of backlash recently from their own people. So Canada needs a conservative government. It's out of control. Really? Yeah. 
We need to have a Reagan era. I don't even I don't even like read the news about Canada. So I have oh, no really, I need I want Canada to have a nice little conservative era. We need to have like another little. Everyone needs to put on sweater vests and go to <laughs> church for a couple of years. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's out of control. Like it's they have like vending machines for crack pipes. Like it's like it's it's at the point where it's like okay guys like just stop doing crack like let's get our shit together. Too it's much. Too much. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. If you live in Canada, let us know. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Uh, you moved to from Canada. Yeah. First years in Europe. Um, how was it? Like, yeah. you choose what country? Well, I went to Australia first for six months. But that's not a Europe. Yeah. Well, I, I sort of forget about <laughs> Australia, but that was like six months. And then I was in Europe for... 12 years. Um, so I lived in Norway for a year. And then I also just traveled a lot and spent a lot of time touring and doing stand up all over the place. I spent a lot of time in Croatia. Okay. I'm half Croatian. And then I lived in Amsterdam. I was based in Amsterdam for four years and then uh, Berlin for five years. Very hot guys in Amsterdam. Yeah. But they're kind of. They're dying out. The Amsterdam gays are um, like, they're sexy and they're tall and they're like and they're they have like kind of a cocky attitude they do yeah they're, but they're like cocky boys yeah. they're like kind of mean the dutch gays and they have like gelled slicked over hair and they like think they're better than you and they look down on you but it's kind of hot when i went to amsterdam i think it's the most drama in gay community i've been there for like five days or six mm -hmm. days and i knew like this one hates this one this one yeah. hates this one and then there was one gay who was like he knew me from tiktok and after the party I was like can i walk you home and he was nice like we talked during the party and we were like yeah maybe not and he was like grabbing me like this uh -huh. and he's like no i'm gonna walk you home and I was like, okay. And uh, he was also military. So Ooh. he, he kind of scared me with yeah. this kind of attitude. But uh, yeah, he walked me home. It was very rainy. Thank God I survived. But mm -hmm. don't do this. <laughs> don't yeah. walk home with the strangers. But it was kind of weird because no one ever grabbed me like this. Yeah. And I like, there was so much drama. It's like, this guy pretends to be 25, even he's 36. This guy takes guys on the boats who are, like, only under 22. Like, there's so much weird shit in Amsterdam. Yeah. Well, and also, I'm... Because I was overweight for so long, now I'm sort of really able to get into the gay world. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, there's sort of... Unfortunately, when you're, like, over 300 pounds or f however big, you're sort of in that bear world... Um, we're getting to the transformation point, yeah. guys. It's so just, now, it's not going to be like, I don't want to like just yeah. give the story right. Yeah. But my whole point, you were like a more invisible and you were in a bear community, I think. Well, um, so I was, well, I don't know. I, I think in general, I was more focused on my comedy career and being a comedian and performing. Um, and so I wasn't like, I was in the gay world and but people knew me more as a comedian and more as someone who was an interesting person and a funny person and uh, fun to be around. Yeah. And um, and I didn't like guys were always very nice to me. Like people weren't uh, they didn't want to fuck me, but they weren't mean to me. Um, Did you felt insecure? I was or very you... oblivious to what my is oblivious? Uh, unaware. I was very like disconnected from reality and disconnected from. I wasn't really aware of the fact that I was so heavy. I was sort of like living in this like uh, delusion. I had this era when, very similar, like you say, you know, I was just working, didn't do any gay mm -hmm. stuff. Till I was 23 years old, I was virgin. Mm -hmm. And I've never done anything with the guys. Like, barely small things, yeah. right? And I, I know, it's people will call me out in the comments, but I truly think, thought that I was like, okay, looking, but I wasn't really attractive. I was, mm -hmm. like, either ghosted a lot by guys or people would just like not treat me well. Yeah. And at some point I really was like, damn, like maybe I'm just too skinny. Mm -hmm. I had this thing that was like too skinny. Maybe it's just my accent. No one likes my accent, but I was ghosted a lot. Like I was trying to like find something on down low, whatever. And until I met my boyfriend, I really did not realize, oh, I'm hot. Like mm. my boyfriend kind of gave me this 
reassurance and confirmation and uh, kind of like brought me, oh, you're so hot. Like I never paid attention that I have a good butt before my boyfriend told me because no one really told me about it before. And I was like so self-conscious mm -hmm. and I was like, I need to go to the gym. It was always fail. <laughs> yeah. I need to go to the gym. And then once I kind of figure out that, okay, yeah, like he told me I'm hot, I'm hot. Then I kind of like noticed that more people would be interested in me when I switched it in my brain in a way. Yeah. So on, on a lot of, and that's why, sorry. Yeah. And the, just to finish it is just, I, the one of the reasons I say always, I was just like kind of virgin. Cause I was like, I moved to America when I was 20, I moved to uh, Poland when I was 17. So I had this survival mode when I have to make money and I really don't have time to think about this, you yeah. know, sex stuff. And then was it excuse? I don't know. Maybe I was just uh, not confident. So yeah. that's what reminds me when you said that at first I was not aware, yeah. uh, oblivious. Yeah. Uh, but I was self insecure. So. Yeah. Well, that a lot of young gay guys are. And, and also a lot of young gay guys, like when you only look at the body of someone and the way someone looks, uh, you'll, you'll find out that there's a lot of people out there who can be not such nice people and, uh, and people that are actually just very shy or very insecure or people that don't really people that are sort of simple people and don't really know that much and are sort of getting by just based on how they look. And, and that's fine too. Like all that really matters ultimately is that you're a good person and good people come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of that now, now that I'm like, now that I'm thin, Coming back, yeah. I can see, I, I see a lot of, I, I can understand things a lot better now. Do you remember when you kind of like hit the point after you moved to Europe, you did comedy, right? Uh -huh. When you hit the point with the alcohol. I or think during the pandemic, uh -huh. like I was very, um, like I drank quite heavily and then um, I gained a lot of followers during the pandemic. Um, and it was just like, it was all a lot to deal with because to go from like having very little social interaction to then everyone, like lots of people knowing me, but lots of people also not really understanding me because a lot of people didn't understand that I was a comedian and I was playing different characters and they also didn't know that I also did stand up. And so just always like having to deal with people's weird reactions to me and their perception of me and how confused they were by me. Um, that was very upsetting for me. And so I can like, I think that I coped with that through drinking more. Uh, and then like life kind of got back to normal, but for me, it was, it was all just a lot to process. And I think that, um, I coped like drinking became something where I was numbing myself from any sort of feeling, not just bad feeling, but just feeling. Interesting. And so once I was able to stop drinking and get sober, I realized, oh my God, like my life is not on a good path. Like, like what am I doing here? Yeah, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like I am not living up to my full potential and I don't have that much time in wow. life. Like life goes by really fast. And so I need to maximize my life and do everything I can to put myself in a good position. How do you numb yourself the process if you look around it back in terms of you just sit at home with a bottle of wine yeah. or like two bottles of wine and, yeah. and you're like, okay, one bottle is done. I want another one. I know it's not yeah. good, but I'm going to go get one. And my then... life was like functional, functional enough. And my shows were like, I was successful enough doing comedy mm -hmm. that I was just managing to like get by. And I had a nice apartment that was inexpensive and I had health insurance and I had, um, you know, enough money for groceries and I had friends and it was all just enough. Okay. And it was enough for me to travel and do shows. And I had everything set up for myself. Like everything was going okay, but it wasn't, it was just at in this level. 
and that and it wasn't uh, getting bigger and it wasn't growing. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like my, my drinking problem was like, I would basically start my day and like do what I needed to do to like, you know, be able to, uh, get groceries or whatever. But then at around four or 5 PM, I would have this feeling of like, Oh, what's going to happen? Like, will, uh, who will hang out with me? What will I do tonight? What will I, uh, you know, and then I'll, j I would just buy a bottle of Prosecco or buy some beers and I would start drinking in the early evening. I have sometimes this, but yeah. not like to the level when I buy two bottles. But yeah. And I would just drink, I could just easily drink all night long. Do you think it has something to do that we are waking up in the morning and like our brain is clear and then we go through yeah. the day and we just have all those dark thoughts or like regular thoughts and I they're all processed yeah. and by the end of the evening you're like scared. Yeah, I think that life is in general, life is very scary. And mm -hmm. if you aren't like in a healthy relationship or if you're not going to therapy or if you're not addressing your existential fears, whatever they might be, then you find ways to cope with it, whether it's uh, alcohol or drugs. But the healthy way to cope with it is go to the gym. I know, right? <laughs> Pickleball. Uh, run, <laughs> play games, yeah. like be with friends, go rock climbing. This like, is such a good point. Do think, like everyone has these feelings. <laughs> It's how you choose to address them. Are you going to do something productive or are you going to do not do it. unhealthy yeah. things that are bad for you i don't think people realize how life is stressful and dangerous like i'm just yeah. sometimes thinking on a deeper level i'm going outside there is like a hundred cars pass me by who can hit me yeah and we just walk in and we're like escaping this process right but there can be like some crazy person who can do something to you right yeah. you can just walk around and you can hit your head on something yeah no or something can fall on you yeah and i feel like we as a people kind of like very used to of uh you know just like dealing with it but it is stressful to just exist yes especially when you exist in new york city like yeah let's, when it's like 10 million people yeah and that's how you get this two bottles of wine but this is also just like we also have to accept that this is life like life is Uh, Survival, to, yeah. Life is meant to be lived as well. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Life is a beautiful gift. You don't have to be afraid of making mistakes. Like, as long as you're a good person and you're there for people and you show up for people and you care about people and you build friendships and you love your family, like, that's the most important thing. How did you switch? You said that one day you woke up and you were like, okay, I'm drinking too much. Yeah. Was someone who told you this? Were, were your friends trying to tell? Um, no, because when you end up like heavily drinking and sort of becoming an alcoholic or a drug, like, I don't think I was necessarily an alcoholic. I think I was a drug, uh, uh, I was abusing alcohol. You end up like life sort of hits you with a pebble and then it hits you with a rock and then it hits you with a boulder. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you start like having nights where you black out or where you do things embarrassing, like do a drunk Instagram live, or you like have those sort of like things where you r show up at a friend's house and you're totally hammered. Like when you have things like that start to happen, that's when it's starting to become a problem, but it's only until you d make the choice. Okay this is too far, this is too much, that you can make a change. But for me, it was like, I had this really, really, really bad hangover, and it was just a very unpleasant evening. And then it was such a bad hangover that I didn't drink for three days, three night, three days. And then I decided to go a couple more days. And then by the sixth day, I was like, oh my, I was clear headed enough that I was like, oh my God, I have to stop drinking. Whenever I drink by myself, my main focus is about work mm -hmm. because what I do and like, it's very unpredictable. I don't have traditional path. I'm always gonna be making more money, making less money, making more money, making less money. Yeah. Do you remember what was in your head when you were drinking already during this night? Like, was something bothering um, you or it was just yeah. like- Yeah, I think that I would tell stories and I, I, I would like watch TV and I would, wa I would like, 
think about, you know, I'd think about different things and sometimes I'd think something was hilarious and then I'd be like really pissed off about something and I'd be in a bitter headspace. It was all just very like crazy, chaotic, like, uh, I'd hang out with people and we'd talk shit and we would just like talk about life and we'd talk about this and we'd talk about that and we'd gossip and we'd trash talk or to be like, that's a bunch of bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Ha, 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 that's hilarious. Like it was just sort of like this very like bipolar, like drunk, like foggy... uh, Feelings. Yeah, Mm-hmm. That was sort of what like drinking was like for me. And you just woke up and you stopped. I did. Yeah. Well, after the sixth day. Sixth day. Yeah. Uh, it took about six days. How many I years? Like, I think I was in that sort of fucked up, unhealthy headspace for maybe uh, like I would say five years. Yeah. That's a long time to be. Well, actually, not necessarily. I think it was like the like three years. Like it was like the pandemic time. Mm-hmm. And then maybe another year after that. The first year I moved to Berlin, I think I was I had a I had focus and I had goals and I was like looking forward to life and I had a plan. And then like that whole Berlin nightlife scene and the people there, once you get hooked into a bad social um circle, like yeah. social circle and like it uh it hook it can hook you in because there's no like people live without a lot of boundaries in berlin <laughs> that's another topic yeah. <laughs> that's another podcast video yeah. <laughs> we talk about berlin yeah you stopped drinking yeah how much did you wait at my largest yeah. i was uh, 420 pounds 420 pounds yeah. how much do you wait now I weigh about 180. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. And uh, how did you go or about it? I realized that the only way I was going to do it was with weight loss surgery. So coincidentally, that sixth day when I was decided to get sober, I had an appointment with a weight loss clinic. Mm-hmm. So that was, um, uh, and that was very hard. Like that took a lot for me to to do that. And uh, I had to do it on my own too. Like I didn't tell anyone that I was friends with because I knew that they, w- on some level, they would make it about them. It is true, yeah. yeah. Or they would, it would be too much for them to handle. Yeah. So, um, very wise or, decision. Or they would put doubts in my mind. Before we, you move forward, uh, just a lot of people are not aware that people do this. Yes. That people make always about themselves yes. very often because they see it. Okay, Daniel, what if something is going to go wrong? Yeah. So they you project, didn't want to be spot. They project all of their neuroses and anxieties onto you. Yeah. So I realized that I had to do it myself. And, uh, and the doctor, like, my God, like my doctor, I love him so much. He actually was in New York and we, uh, we hung out, we had dinner together, Dr. Martin Susven, <laughs> Martin Susven. And he's so great. And he was very just matter of fact. And he was like, you are very obese. I know it, you know it. So what shall be done about it? And he just (laughs) explained the different surgeries. But hearing him just say, you are very obese. You are very obese and you need this surgery. It would not work in America. (laughs) Honestly, like it felt so good. I was like, oh, thank you. I was like, thank you for telling me that I need this surgery because I knew that I needed this surgery. And just like, it felt like this weight had been lifted off of me. I was like, thank you. Thank you for telling me I need this because I knew that I couldn't do it. He was like, you have been, if you have been overweight your whole life, you will never be able to lose this weight without this surgery. And when he told me that, I was like, ah. Oh, Yes, I know I can't do it on my own. Like, I can't do it on my own. Cut out my stomach. (laughs) I need it. (laughs) And uh, what happened next? So then he basically outlined a plan for me uh, for how long it would take. 
So basically, you got your stomach cut. Yeah. So basically, I had the gastric sleeve surgery. Mm -hmm. So they remove 80% of your stomach. How does it work? So basically, well, they they come up with a plan for you because you have to go through all these different tests. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to have your heart checked and blood work, and you have to have like a a CAT scan done of your stomach and all these different things uh, for my insurance to cover it. So you basically, you could pay for it outright, but they also want to make sure you get nutrition nutritional counseling and you start, uh, you want to lose weight leading up to it. Mm -hmm. So basically I went through this sort of four month process, getting sober, doing all this, uh, learning about the surgery and what will happen after it. And, um, and then I got the surgery. So basically in May, I made the decision that I was going to get it. And then I had the surgery in October. Pretty quick. Do you remember, like, uh, did you felt something? Was the recovery hard or no? I mean, it's it's a weird question. (laughs) Yeah, I loved the whole process. Mm -hmm. I embraced it. I loved it. I was so excited to have it done. I was so excited to go through the whole thing. So did they cut... You had you weighed 420 yeah. pounds. Did they cut out of you 200 right away, or how was no, it? No, I think that I lost. By the time I had the surgery, I had lost about. Um, I think I lost about 70 pounds. Mm-hmm. I have to go back and look at my notes, but I think I had lost. I was I was about when we when I had the surgery. I think I was about 350 pounds. Mm-hmm. So I had already lost. Maybe I lost 60 pounds. I, I can't entirely remember. I have to look at my notes. Mm-hmm. But I had lost a lot of weight already. Yeah. So they basically they do it laparoscopically, and they do this thing where they cut and staple your stomach, and they pull it out of one of the little holes and they throw it away. Mm-hmm. So I just have a very small stomach. So I'm very li- I'm limited in how much I can eat. So but, you cannot eat as much as you used to. Yeah, but also I was more the drinking was more the problem with than okay. food. Mm-hmm. I did eat more, a lot because I but it would mainly be because I was hungover or because like I was yeah, definitely I did eat a lot as well, but it was more drinking that was the problem. Calories yeah. from drinking. What yeah. was the drinks? I would drink, when I started to gain, I would drink a lot of beer. Okay, beer is what yeah. it makes it, yeah. But really what what would fuck me up was Prosecco. Oh. And a lot of people drink Prosecco in Berlin. There's this uh, one kind of pr- really cheap East Ger- Berlin Prosecco, East German Prosecco, Rotkapschen. Okay. And when I started uh, drinking a lot, I would have Prosecco on ice. I would have Rotkapschen on ice. And th- a lot of people in Berlin drink that. And it's so sweet, you forget it's alcohol. And I would just drink it like it was so. I would just, I could have like three bottles of rote caption and I'd be all fucked up and I'd be like, oh, it was awful. Yeah. And it was like that really like sugary hangover. About, hangover is bad, right? The sugary yeah. rote caption hangover is like. Were you, were you into wine? Not really, no. Mm. Okay. No. Makes sense. Yeah, because so, I couldn't guggle, guzzle it. I like to guzzle so alcohol. How yeah. long, just out of curiosity, how long was the surgery for? Oh. You know, taking 60 yeah. pounds out of you. It's no, a, they don't take, they remove your they remove stomach. stomach. Yeah. yeah. Remo- I'm, I'm yeah. just being, you know, obnoxious. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying that taking this big part of you. Yeah. How long is the surgery? So that surgery is not that long. Like, I think it's only an uh, 40 minutes or an okay, hour. Oh, that's not a lot at all. I could actually walk after it. Period. Like, I, I, um, I, like you, you're actually, like, I You knew, clocked it. You're you right basically, there. they fill you up with air uh-huh. so that they can um, see, like, everything. So really, the painful part is the gas. So you have to get up and walk as much as you can and burp as much as you can. Interesting. Because it's the air that stays inside of you mm-hmm. that's the most painful painful so after the surgery i made sure to get get up and walk and like really burp as much as possible Mm -hmm. and then i was fine like i wasn't in so much pain i had gallbladder surgery like because you end up um because your stomach is isn't producing as much acid your gallbladder keeps um producing the same amount of bile so usually you have to have your gallbladder removed within a year and i had that as well i had gallstones so the gallbladder surgery was more painful than the than the stomach removal surgery i don't even know what it responds is for gallbladder a gallbladder it's like 
it produces bile. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what bile is. No. <laughs> we don't have to go there. Yeah. So it was one surgery total? Yeah. So I had a bunch of surgeries. First, I had the weight loss surgery. Mm -hmm. Then I had a hair transplant. Mm -hmm. Then I had um, a facelift, mm -hmm. a face and neck lift, because I had lost so much weight that I had um, lots of loose skin on my face. Yep. And then I had my body done. So I had a tummy tuck and a mastectomy. And then I had um, the gallbladder surgery. And now I need one, I need to have my inner thighs and another one on my stomach. Cause I still, I had, I had so much skin on my stomach. I'll have one more going down like this. Does it heal later on or how does it, how does it look after? Are you happy with it? Yeah, well, I still have a lot of loose skin, mm -hmm. so there's still a lot of skin that has to be done, but I'm really happy with my facelift and mm -hmm. my neck lift. That was like so great, yeah. I've never seen you before, so. You never seen me heavy? I found the pictures after, uh -huh. yeah. So it was a very, very big difference. It was yeah. like completely different people. That's yeah, totally. I'm gonna put it in a thumbnail, okay. maybe, before sure. and after. Have you got a like some critical comments from people who are overweight who are like don't promote this love your body the way you are yeah body positivity which is we're not against i'm just curious if you got a backlash for what you decided to do with your body well it happened very fast mm -hmm. um so i had like uh i didn't really tell people that i was um that I had gotten the surgery until three months after. And then even then people didn't really um, like clue in. I ended up like within a year really losing almost 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. So it was a very um, sudden change for people. I was quite surprised. There were a lot of people in my life and people that I was friends with who weren't happy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because you lost a bunch of weight? You, they're people not happy. aren't happy when you change for the better. Okay. A lot of people will find things about you that before didn't bother them, but when you look different, it all of a sudden bothers them. Because now you're more threatening to them. I don't know. I think that you, you, I think it triggers something in people to see you change your life for the better mm -hmm. because it shows that them that there are things that maybe they're unhappy with that they weren't able to change. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you have to prepare. So even people in your friends, some yeah. friends were not happy about you. Yeah. Like. like very close friends. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It, what was the, the argument behind it? They thought that I was shallow. Shallow? They thought that I was um, not, or, but it was more, I think that it was more that they had people in their social circle okay. who, was, who were jealous of me and that put that into their heads. Because once they actually asked me about it and I told them like, what I was feeling and going through and the spiritual journey that I was taking, like, it's a private thing. Like, I'm not going to be like sharing my journals with people and letting you know about like my personal struggles. Yeah. You're just going to see me physically change. And then you're going to think, oh my God, and he's getting a facelift. Like all this, th this sort of, you're making the assumption that for me, it's this, shallow surfacey journey because you're not seeing the deeper things that I'm going through. Mm -hmm. So you're projecting a lot of people. What I've learned is a lot of people project their own insecurities, uh, insecurities their own lack of morals, their own lack of kindness onto other people. Maybe that's why internet hate on a rise so much because you can hide behind the yeah no no picture right so yeah. and then you tell something about someone it's like homophobia when i have homophobic comments a lot of them probably gay yeah <laughs> they just can't accept it well and also people are also just assholes yeah, people are just openly assholes mm -hmm. because now you can pretty much we live in this society where you can just say anything and be an asshole and be a mean person and you're rewarded for it sometimes or you're just uh, there's no consequences for you because you just have your asshole friends and you are all mean shitty people together and we're they're just like hey yeah yeah, we're horrible. These are me and my horrible friends. And there's no consequences. What's the alternative, you think? 
we can't punish people for their words. Uh -huh. There should be freedom of speech. What's the alternative for the reality? I think we should reward people that are nice and reward. That's a good point. Yeah, reward yeah. people who are nice. Reward people who are making a difference and make like helping people cool. Make uh, being a, caring about your neighbor cool. Mm -hmm. Make it cool to be uh, to be uh, in a community. Make it cool to like let's get together and do something nice for people. Not because we're like showing people that we're good people because we actually just care about each other. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Rewarding people for being nice. Yeah. So then everyone becomes <laughs> fake nice. Yeah, exactly. So no, but at least it's fake yeah, nice. It, it's better than being mean. Yeah. If there's someone who watches us and has the similar issue, what would you say to this person? I know it's a very broad question, yeah. right? But like, what would one advise for you to be to this person how do you like okay i actually need help for you it sounds like it was you hit the rock bottom and like you just six days after you're like done with it which yeah. is incredible a lot of people cannot do this they just yeah. keep coming back how do yeah. not keep coming back did you had a, a point when you're like okay i really want a bottle of prosecco with yeah. the ice today you have to really really not want it and you have to start like looking at all the things once you start looking at all the things that bring happy ha brings happiness into your life and know that it's right there mm -hmm. you start to you just change the way you see things and mm -hmm. you start getting joy from these positive things instead of the negative things. You just have to really want it. And you have to like accept help. Mm -hmm. Like there are people out there that will help you and want to help you. Like Dr. Seussvind who helped me with my weight, you know, having that uh, nutritionist and having this person to having someone to like listen to you and give you an outline of something you can do if you are brave enough to go out and ask for help, there will be someone there that will want to help you. And that even if it's their job to help you, there will be that help. So you have to be willing to take it. But I think anytime you really, really want to change your life, you have to think about, okay, this is where I want to be. You have to come up with a plan and a goal to get there. And then you have to every day like work on it and commit Stick to, to the it plan, yeah. and, and commit to it and and be kind to yourself. The main thing is like not being so hard on yourself. Give me advice. If I'm overthinking uh, and like always being hard on myself, how do I stop being hard on myself? Because I think I am sometimes. It's yeah. like I do stuff to go forward, but I want to be faster. Oh. I want to have $10 million tomorrow. Oh. I, want, I want the podcast to get 10 sponsorships and uh, I want it to blow up. But I know it takes time and, you know, so sometimes I was like, am I behind? Even though I'm moving forward. Yeah. How do you not be hard on yourself? Well, how do you switch the mind? It is Just hard. It's very difficult. Go to psychologist. Yeah. It's very difficult. I think that you have to just sometimes take deep breaths. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to people that love you and share that with them. Accept a big hug. Um, you know, realize that uh, a lot of these people that are successful are also bad people. That's so, not an excuse for me, though. Well, I don't know. For me, that helps me sometimes. It helps me sometimes because I mean, I'm like, the... well, at least I'm not like I could have a lot of money, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be happy or a nice person. Yeah. So focus on what you have. Be grateful for what you have and think about it like, you know, what could what is there for me to offer as opposed to like, what can I get or what can I achieve? Be like. I'm so grateful that I'm here. What more can I offer the world? Do you, you know? compare yourself to other people? No. Never. I'm not like that. There are some times where I might have tinges of jealousy, but i that's a quality of me. And people that know me well know that about me. I'm very much not a jealous person. There might be some times where someone's a dick and they're or like an ass kiss because one thing i'm also not an ass kisser i'm very honest and i'm and i'm very like i'm not good at playing games or manipulating people mm -hmm. or like lying like what you see is what you get i remember watching a oprah episode when i was a kid and oprah said when you're running a marathon 
the energy it takes for you to look behind you to compare yourself to how far away the competition is, yeah. that slows you down. And I remember hearing that when I was like 10 or 11 and being like, okay, that makes sense. And I always understood that. That makes sense. Yeah. Actually, that's a great advice. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just forget about things. Yes. I forget about it. It's like I know them, but I forget about yeah. them. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your new body. Thanks. I'm very, very Still happy. Still working on it. It's good. You're going to get there. And yeah. uh, you, I hope you started going to the gym. You have Ukrainian trainer or did you quit? Yeah. Them? Well, we haven't really continued. I go to Equinox. I'm an Equinox gay. <laughs> I, I don't do a lot. I have to do more weight training. Mm -hmm. Right now, I still have like more skin to have to removed. Get rid of. So yeah, I'm doing that in two months. You are Canadian, and you said you will choose America over Canada a hundred times out of a hundred times, mm. or no? It depends for what phase in you your life. You said in the beginning of interviews. You well, it depends what phase of your life you're in. And it depends the sort of person you are. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I have a lot of ideas and I have things I want to achieve. And I don't think I can fully do that in Canada. Will you choose America over Canada a hundred times out of a hundred times? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> I don't know if it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I prefer Canadian Thanksgiving because I love Thanksgiving so much. I can't You're wait. You're Thanksgiving, yeah. I can't wait till November. I want it in October. What's the difference between Canadian and American Thanksgiving? It comes earlier. Do okay. you know why it comes earlier? I have no idea. Because the harvest comes earlier in Canada because it's further north. That's why we have it a like a month earlier. What is the harvest? Like the harvest is like back in the old times when mm -hmm. everyone would make pumpkins and everything. Mm -hmm. That's when you'd like collect the everything. Growing. So when is the Canadian Thanksgiving? It's the first week of October. Oh my gosh, that's so soon. It's so soon. Oh my god. Yeah, but it's all the same food, mm -hmm. pretty much. But you say you can't wait for November. Well, November is a sadder month. Yeah. Yeah. All the Christmas cheer hasn't started yet. Period. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Although autumn in New York it's is incredible. spectacular, and you get to wear cashmere. After being in the U.S. for one year, what are the things that you don't like here? I don't like that everybody hates each other so much, especially when it comes to politics. Mm -hmm. Everyone, as soon as someone disagrees with you or you hear something that you don't like or you take something the wrong way, immediately everyone's like, screw you and everyone talk to you again. Screw you, you're invisible to me. Screw you, you're dead to me. Especially like in media, like there's no actual debate, like in mainstream media, there's no one actually sits down and has a calm discussion. Everything is very confrontational with like the most extreme people. So all these extremists are basically making money off of creating chaos and havoc in society. Is it different horrible. in Europe? Oh yes, in Europe, like well, in most European countries, there's parliamentary systems. Mm -hmm. So um, there's more exchange of ideas mm -hmm. and people have to sort of listen to each other and look at different policies. And so there's more diversity in terms of um, what people are putting forward as platforms. So there's like five or six parties as opposed to two. And then also like in Germany, after there's an election, all the members, uh, all the leaders of the different parties sit down and talk about the election and talk about the results and talk about who's going to work with who to form a government. Yeah. So there's, there's a real idea, you know, idea of compromise mm -hmm. and, and not this sort of real vitriolic hate between Americans. And regardless of the party, like, I don't understand why you have to hate each other just because you have differences of opinion. Do you think it's going to collapse at some point? I hope so. Yeah, because I think that it, it, it at this point, the entire mainstream media is just... Like every single journalist is just every other station other than Fox News. There's like Republican news and then every other station is just Democratic news. There's no real uh, journalism. It's all activism. So at that point, when like one party is controlling all the mainstream news, you're basically like living in communism. What do you think about Twitter and Elon Musk? Well, yeah, like I think he's like... I don't have the best feelings around him. Like, <laughs> Me too. But like, Do you think that person with so least, much power over one platform is healthy? Well, but at the same time, like it seems like there's no limits on free speech. So in a way, we can see what 
people are really thinking and what the reality of different situations are. So like the American public can see what's happening. What's the best advantage living in the US comparing to Europe? Well, English as a first language. Mm -hmm. To live in Europe as a comedian, I was limited in terms of, I had been on German television. It was like, uh, I was on the German version of like, Uh, last week tonight mm -hmm. that had never really happened that an English person was on a German TV show doing a German sketch or yeah. an English language sketch on a German show yeah. that was cool but that was like as far as you're gonna go in like as an English speaker in German society is Netherlands the same or no The Netherlands is more, uh, there was actually an English language uh, Dutch TV show mm -hmm. that was like a political comedy show mm -hmm. that Tom Rhodes had like uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. But for the most part, the Dutch want to preserve Dutch language and Dutch culture. But in the Netherlands, like you could perform anywhere mm -hmm. in English and it wouldn't be a problem. Whereas in Germany, there's a lot of people who don't speak English because they dub their um, television. Yeah, Sam, that's they, how I grew up. Yeah, yeah. so in, in the Netherlands, everything, a lot of things are with subtitles. subtitles. Yeah, it's smaller European countries know English better than the big. So like Spain, France, Germany, Italy, uh, the big countries that have their own film and television industry or um, dub, they have a harder time with English than the smaller countries. Maybe it's better for them to keep the culture. Yeah, I agree. But in terms yeah. of immigrant, you just want to be somewhere where there's a broader appeal. Whatever, to each his own. Yeah. own. I actually wanted to finish right now, but since you talked about Netherlands, mm -hmm. it's just last topic. Uh, I wanted to ask you, the Netherlands recently showed that acceptance of LGBTQ people went very much down and it's like below 50%, it's like 49% now. So 51% don't accept or like don't support. I think it was only Gen Z. I don't remember exactly. When you lived in the Netherlands and you've been there for a while mm -hmm. and you have friends probably, right? Do you have any idea what could have changed? I don't know what that statistic is about because the Netherlands is... Like, unless there's shifts in demographics in terms of new immigrants coming in from cultures that don't accept gay people as much, Maybe there is that could be a problem, mm -hmm. an issue. But being pro-gay is, like, not even... It's, like, so ridiculous. The mm -hmm. Netherlands is, like, that. that's not even an issue. Like, being gay is celebrated in the Netherlands. It's just a normal part of Dutch society. Which is, I like, yeah. I, but I have like, some followers who texted me now, and then there's, there's, like, new data, and they're afraid, and, you know... Well, I think that that definitely is... a Like, the Netherlands has a lot going on with Hart Wilders right now, mm -hmm. and with the amount of, um, like, influx of... Um, people from the Middle East coming mm -hmm. in. And so that is uh, that is a whole other issue. So that needs to be, all throughout Europe, that has to be, people have to sort of make a, a real decision about, okay, are we, what are our values and what is the West? What is Europe? What is America? Mm -hmm. We have certain values and laws that we, want to preserve and freedoms and i think that like to be uh whether you're part of being in a western society is that uh you are there are people who are christian who are jewish who are muslim uh who you or who aren't religious or who uh are what hindu whatever but we're going to live under this set of values So that is the principle of a Western Judeo-Christian society. It's not to say that Muslims or people who are Arab or people who are from whatever culture can't be in that society. It's just a matter of what laws and what values we're going to adhere to. Yeah. That's a good answer. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah. That was an incredible conversation. Yeah. Um, you have your store you launched recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. Power Gay. Yes. So I'm going to leave a link in the description. Yes. You guys get a Power Gay merch. Support Lots of Daniel. fun t-shirts. And, and I'm writing a book as well. I'm okay, you write. When is it? Yeah. It's um, a long time to write it, right? I'm going to try before the end of the year. We'll see. Oh, that's ambitious. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. I have a, a lot of things already written out. So, But yeah, I have lots of t-shirts and stuff and um, I'm building my brand. 
and follow him on Instagram. Yeah, follow me on Instagram. He has a lot of funny stories from Fire Island. Yeah, and maybe uh, I'll bring him for like less serious conversation, but yeah. I do like to have serious conversations yeah, totally. with him. Yes. And uh, don't forget yeah. to say hi from Art. Yeah. Check out my VIP page if you want to support our channel or if you want to be a sponsor of this podcast. Yeah. Email us. Yeah. We need we need sponsors, guys. Yeah, you gotta and join his OnlyFans. He's so hot. We're trying our best. Yeah, <laughs> we've been going to the gym. Don't you so. want to see him naked? Honestly, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, please subscribe. Only friends. All the all the stuff. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah, no problem. And uh, you guys, um, thank you for joining for the gaze of our yeah. days. Bye. Okay, that was so perfect. Yeah, that's great. Now we can repeat. Do you have time right now?